Welcome back for some more video lectures for um, critical reasoning. This is uh, video lecture two for the formal evaluations of arguments where we do our little um, crash course in formal logic. So we're going to get back to how to understand this formal symbolic logical language. Um, and this is probably the last time you'll see my face because most of what we have to do is on a little like pseudo whiteboard I'll be working on. So um, if you remember from last time I kind of gave a big overview of everything that we're going to be doing um, in in uh, this module and uh, what I'm my plan is right now is to really dig into what's happening with the logical symbol language instead of thinking about English um, because English you know one of the steps of this is going to be to do a translation from uh, English presentations of arguments um, let me try to make this a little bit bigger in English whoa <laughs> uh, the first the first step of the logical uh, in, in order to get to the logical anal analysis step first we have to take an argument that is in English and then translate it into symbolic logic and these are like two different languages they are you know you got one language over here and there's a meaning that's expressed there and then there's another one over here and we're trying to figure out how to get this to go with this and just like if you were taking a foreign language course you know you already have a natural language that you're familiar with but you need to know what are the connections about how to express the meanings that we express with certain words in English into whatever language you're trying to translate things into but that requires you to know what's actually happening with this language. And if I just give you, if you, if you just received like a tourist's book of a bunch, like a phrase book that just tells you about how to say certain phrases like where's the bathroom in a foreign language, you wouldn't really know the language. You really, you wouldn't be able to deal with novel situations. You wouldn't be able to be creative with how you express yourself. You would just be like this really mechanical thing that doesn't really operate with understanding even if occasionally they can say the right thing at the right moment uh, and successfully communicate in some limited capacity. That's the same problem we've got with I think the way that the book elects to kind of introduce you to symbolic logic. They try to talk about the English stuff first and how to do the translation without really knowing how the symbol language works. So we're going for the time being to forget about English and English arguments and just focus on symbolic logic and what's happening with this logical symbol language and how meaning is expressed here. Now, if you remember from my diagram that I had in the last lecture, I have this little thing down here that's highlighted. That's because it's the most important idea <laughs> for understanding symbolic logic. The, the meaning, the logical meaning of a proposition or claim or an expression, like one of a symbolic expression of a claim or proposition in symbolic logic, the meaning of those things are defined by their truth conditions. When something is true versus when it is false. So um, if you remember from before, and, and this is the kind of thing I'm going to dig into more detail in this lecture, but we had all these different possible conditions that the world could be in. And this was supposed to cover all of the bases. I'm going to talk more about how it does that. But um, you have all these possibilities for how things could be. And the chart shows you under which of these possibilities this statement is true. So in the case of and, the conjunction, it's only true when the two component parts of it are true. And in all the other circumstances, those are conditions under which the statement is false. So knowing what it would take for that statement to be true and what it would take for it to be false sort of defines the meaning of this expression logically. The truth conditions of a statement give you the meaning of that statement. And that's actually something that you could um, think about even um, if you're just thinking about natural languages. So let's say I make a claim in English right now, like um, the Cubs will win the World Series. So actually, at the time of this recording, we're down 0-1 uh, to the Cleveland Indians. So uh, it's been a pretty sad night for me. Um, but I'm trying to put that behind me and give you some uh, quality, um, quality education here. Uh, quality instruction, but um, if I make that claim, the Cubs will win the World Series. Now, you may not know whether that's true or false. I probably don't know whether that's true or false. I mean, I'm just saying I'm making the claim. 
Um, but because we understand the meaning of it, we know what it would take for it to be true and what it would take for it to be false. Let's say uh, the Cubs lose all of the games of the World Series. So if that happens, those are conditions under which my statement would not be true. God forbid that that happens if we lose all of the games. But if it did, my statement, the Cubs will win the World Series, that's a false statement under those circumstances. So even without getting into the symbolic stuff, we already think about the meaning of a claim that is made based on the kinds of uh, conditions in the world that would have that statement be true versus the ones in which it would be false. You can kind of think about the meaning of an expression of any claim, any expression that we make ever, regardless of what language we're doing it, as sort of getting its meaning from the shape of under what circumstances would that statement come out true and under what circumstances would it turn out false. Um, here's an, This is the kind of goofy example I usually use when I'm not so depressed and sad about my Cubs losing. Um, but the one I, I've usually used in my lectures is a totally wacky claim. I may have even mentioned before in this class, but um, take this claim. You, you, Even if you don't know whether this claim is true, you know what it means. And the, the fact that it's even intelligible to you is interesting. Um, but here's the claim. There are aliens on Alpha Centauri that like Nicolas Cage movies. Now, I don't, I don't know if that claim is true or false. I don't know. But there is a fact about whether it's true or false. And I know at least what it would mean if it was true. I know what kinds of circumstances would be consistent with the claim being true and what circumstances would be inconsistent with it being true. In other words, what circumstances would make the claim false. So I don't know which one is which because I don't know which is the real world. I don't know which of those possibilities is what's actually happening. But I do know what it would mean. And that's the key idea here. And I'm going to draw a little picture to try to help with this. And this is a picture you've seen before. Um, so uh, this is when we were talking about validity before. Remember I was setting up these um, categories of different types of possibility. And we talked about logical possibility. And logical possibility is bounded by um, the sort of boundary here that, that encloses what is logically possible is bounded by the law of non-contradiction. And there's other notions of possibility that we could use. A much more restricted sense versus logical possibility would be um, physical possibility. And that's bounded by the laws of nature. So whatever are the rules for how nature works, that sets what is physically possible. And anything that violates the laws of nature is physically impossible. Logical possibility is much larger. It encapsulates more um, possible space here. There are more possibilities that count as logically possible than count as physically possible because the only thing that restricts what is logically possible is that the thought or the claim can't involve a contradiction. So claims that are out here, these are claims that have contradictions present in them. But any claim inside of here, um, any, any of these possibilities, um, is possible as long as it just doesn't violate itself, which <laughs> leaves a lot of really wacky things. Like, there's all uh, contemporary philosophers like to talk about, uh, or very often like to talk about possibility here in terms of possible world space. So there's all these different uh, worlds of how things could be. Think about them like alternate realities, um, and all of them are logically possible in as much as they don't involve some sort of contradiction of terms. When I was talking about these notions of possibility before, I was saying that another boundary that is um, interesting to think about or that's helpful here is the boundary of what is conceivable. And if something is conceivable, it's definitely logically possible. There's also some things that are logically possible that are inconceivable just because our imaginations are too limited or the claims are too complex for us to hold in our brains all at the same time or something like that. Um, but the, the thing that is um, definitely true is that stuff that is out here, stuff that is logically impossible because it violates the law of non-contradiction, is inconceivable. It is definitely outside the boundary of what is conceivable. You can actually not conceive of a contradiction. You can have two different claims that you hold at different times, or two different beliefs that you hold at different times that can contradict each other, but you cannot actually conceive in the same thought of a contradiction. You can't imagine the red car that's not red. 
And if you think you can, talk to me, and we'll debate it. <laughs> I think I'll be able to show you that you can't, or that you're playing with some funny business here by redefining terms in inappropriate ways. Um, but that is, that's a pretty important aspect to logical possibility. Now, this was all important before, because we were trying to evaluate the concept of validity. And validity is the whole game when it comes to formal logic. Formal logic it only exists to basically test the validity of arguments. That's the entire game right there. But before, we didn't have this kind of really formalized system to, with which to do this, like I was kind of demonstrating in my last lecture. Before, we were just using our imagination to test the validity of arguments. Because validity, if an argument is valid, it's saying that it's impossible in the sense of logical possibility. It's logically impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false at the same time. That's why I was talking about validity is saying that the premises provide a total guarantee for the truth of the conclusion as long as the premises are true. If the premises are true, they provide that total guarantee for the truth of the conclusion. That's an incredible standard of reasoning. And if an argument can meet that standard, then that is pretty close to what we would commonly call a proof. Um, or maybe even a technical sense of the word proof. Um, so that's pretty amazing if we can do it. But what we had to do was try to cover all this possible world space with our imagination. We had to try to conceive of a um, counterexample to an argument's validity. And if we couldn't conceive of it, then we were like, okay, I guess the argument's valid. But that is going to be problematic because our imagination is only able to cover like some of this ground of what is logically possible. It can't cover all of it. Um, our, our imaginations are limited. Um, there's some really funky arguments that are actually invalid, although their counterexamples might not be things that you would commonly think about. Um, one of my favorite ones this is really weird. It comes from a logic text. Um, so it has this, this argument. The conclusion is, or the premise is, um, all leopards with lungs are carnivores. Therefore, all leopards are carnivores. Now that argument is invalid because you could have leopards without lungs that are not carnivores. Maybe they're vegan. I don't know. That's logically conceivable, even though it doesn't seem very physically possible. Like, how do you have a leopard without lungs? How would that happen? But it's still logically possible. There's no contradiction involved conceptually with the idea of leopards that don't have lungs being vegans. That's a counterexample to that argument. It's still consistent with the premise being true that the leopards with lungs are carnivores. Maybe that's true. But the conclusion being false that all leopards are carnivores. You know, you got some variety. you got your leopards with lungs and the leopards without lungs. But maybe your imagination wouldn't go to thinking about leopards without lungs. You know, that's not something you might be doing. So we might want to have um, a test for validity that isn't so vulnerable to this kind of... Um, failure of imagination or us just missing something. We might want to have an exhaustive way of proving the validity of an argument and we can do that with formal logic. So let me, um, let's clear the board here for a second. Um, so again, let's, let's think about possible world space. So here's all the possibilities of what could happen. Um, and somewhere in this set there is the actual world. Let's just call it A for actual. I don't know where this actual world is really located. Um, I know some facts about the world, and presumably you do too, although maybe some there are some skeptical philosophers who would challenge our knowledge about anything. But um, let's, you know, just using common sense here, we know some facts about the world. But that's not enough to know exactly which of all of these possible worlds is the actual world because the actual world would we to do that we would have to know all of the facts of our universe which we do not and we never will know okay all these other possibilities this there could be a, a another nearby possible world that's exactly the same as the actual world except only one fact has changed there's only one alternative difference that has occurred um, other ones are like way out here very very different but here's the thing I don't need to cover all of this territory with my imagination and with validity in particular it doesn't really matter what is the actual world we don't care 
because the only thing we care about with validity is what's possible. We don't really care about what's actual. We're just looking for counterexamples anywhere we can get them in this entire space of what's possible. Remember when we were talking about validity before, I was really trying to emphasize that if you're trying to evaluate the validity of an argument and you find yourself thinking a lot about what you know, then you are already barking up the wrong tree because validity doesn't depend on what you know about the world. It doesn't depend on your uh, intelligence or smarts or the facts you know about what's going on with reality. It only depends on just what is possible and what's conceivable. So um, it, we, we only care about the possibilities. We don't care about where the actual world is. But here's the thing. I don't have to try to spread out my imagination to cover all this possible world space. I can capture all of this world. Uh, all of, I can sort of try to cover all of the bases here uh, very, very simply um, through exploiting the law of non-contradiction. So let's go back here to the diagram that I made here. Um, we were trying to figure out the truth conditions. Under what conditions, under which possibilities, is the statement P and Q true when P and Q stand for more simple propositions? Like maybe you remember my example with, um, uh, you know, um, Colonel Mustard is the murderer uh, or um, Miss Scarlet is the murderer. That was an or statement, so the wedge is what we use for or one of these things, this is true or this other thing is true. At least one of them is true. That's what or means, logically. But whatever the expression is, I want to figure out when it's true and when it's false based on the truth of its component parts. That means that this more complex statement is just talking about things that have to do with this claim and this claim. Maybe that Miss Scarlet is a murderer or Colonel Mustard is the murderer. Okay. This time we're using P's and Q's instead of C's and S's, but the letters don't matter. That's an arbitrary choice. So I only need to look at the conditions for what's happening with reality with respect to these particular facts. Like whether Obama is the President of the United States or not is not relevant to the claim that Miss Scarlet and Colonel Mustard are both murderers. Like I don't need to worry about those other facts. I just need to worry about those aspects of possible worlds that have to do with the particular statements in question. So if I'm trying to cover all of my bases here, to think about all the different possibilities here, in one fell swoop I can categorize all these possible worlds. I don't have to use my imagination. In just one fell swoop I can separate them into worlds in which the proposition is true and worlds in which the proposition is false. So going back, the law of non-contradiction is saying, for any claim, it is either true or false. It cannot be both true and false. It cannot be neither truth, true nor false at the same time, in the same world. So of all these different possible worlds that are out there, they're either worlds in which P is a true statement or worlds in which P is a false statement. And if I can do this one, and see, I've covered everything. Everything's in one of these two categories. Again, I don't know where the actual world is, maybe, because I mean, don't, maybe I don't know the truth of P. Maybe proposition P is that there are aliens on Alpha Centauri that like Nicolas Cage movies. And I don't know whether that's true or false in the actual world, but I know that all worlds are either in the category of worlds in which that statement is true, or worlds in which there are no aliens on Alpha Centauri that like Nicolas Cage movies. It's one or the other, okay? So um, I've split up all the possible worlds. I've covered all the bases with respect to P being true or false. And if I can do it once, I can do it twice. I can split it in half again. And this time, I'm going to split it between worlds in which statement Q is true or worlds in which Q is false. Remember, the little tilde again just means uh, not. It's the negation just means false. Um, we will we'll talk more about the tilde uh, here in a second, but that's that's what it is. So there's now we've got four categories here. See, there's worlds in which P and Q are both true. There's worlds in which P is true but Q is false. Okay, worlds in which Q is true and P is false, or worlds in which they're both false. Q and P are both false, and those are all the possibilities. There's no other possibility. I use the metaphor in the last lecture of a control panel with levers that are in you know certain they can either be in the on position or the off position and there's only so many combinations of different arrangements that you can put those levers in if you've got two of those levers and they can only be in one position of two 
Um, you've only got four possible combinations here. Both on, both off, one off, the other one on, vice versa. That's it. Um, just to maybe talk about P's and Q's is a little too abstract here. So let's think back to this claim um, that we were considering in the in the example argument from last time of uh, C or S, I believe it was. And just imagine that P's and Q's are now C's and S. Uh, okay, let's let's just make it, let's just clean it up for fun. Uh, not to make it more confusing. Here, I'm going to pause it. I'll be right back in the video. All right, so I, I've uh, fixed it up now. So now we're we're we're, we're focusing on evaluating the claim um, C or S is true. At least one of these two claims is true. And um, I've split up all the possibilities here. So if C stand stood for Colonel Mustard is a murderer and S stands for Miss Scarlet is a murderer, then this category right here would be for possibilities in which both Colonel Mustard and Miss Scarlet are the murderer. Maybe they worked it together or something. That'd be weird in Clue because there'd have to have been some mistake where both cards I got put inside the envelope and that's not supposed to happen, but it could still happen. And maybe there's just, you know, it's a low likelihood, but it's still a possibility that maybe both cards got put in the envelope. Um, there's worlds in which neither one of them is the murderer. That's down here. Th these would be possibilities in which Colonel Mustard is the murderer, um, but Miss Scarlet is not. And these would be worlds in which Miss Scarlet is the murderer. That's a true statement, but Colonel Mustard is not the murderer. That's a false statement to say that uh, Colonel Mustard is the murderer. So we've got all the bases covered. And notice how within these different categories, you know, there's other facts that could be true or false or whatever, like whether the candlestick was the murder weapon or the revolver or whether the murder happened in um, the ballroom or in the billiard room or wherever or whether my friend um, uh, Steven is you know a fun person to play this board game with or not a fun person to play this board game with I mean whatever it is there's a lot of other facts that would define the worlds that are in these categories but we're not interested in that to figure out how to evaluate what's going on with this statement because this statement is only talking about claims that are relevant to these two facts whether Miss Scarlet and Colonel Mustard are murderers or not that's all we're caring about okay so I want to actually use this opportunity to start talking about um, the specific um, meanings of these different logical symbols so with this one we're talking about or and uh, one thing that I, I maybe maybe or is not the best one for us to start with. Let, let's start instead with and. Um, I want to do that instead. Let's start with and. Um, and eventually we're going to try out all of them. So there's there's only so many different types of possibilities. Actually, let me. I'll, we're using S and C, so I'm just going to keep doing that here. Um, we've got um, we can say and statements. We can say or statements. We can do that. We can make um, conditional statements. Um, oh, I need to grab my conditional thing. Okay, so we can make conditional statements, which is saying if something, then something else is true. So if this, if C is true, if it's true that Colonel Mustard is a murderer, then Miss Scarlet is a murderer. We can also make statements that we don't, you don't hear this very often, but philosophers use this all the time. Um, and I have used it occasionally in a couple lectures, but this, this is the biconditional. It says if and only if. So this is saying Colonel Mustard is a murderer if and only if Miss Scarlet is a murderer too. And then the negation, which allows you to say something is false. That's it. I mean, this is, these are the only logical symbols we'd ever have to worry about. But each one of these works in a different way. And that's what this truth table is showing, is that each logical operator has a different impact on the truth of the statement that it's modifying. So uh, I was talking about compound versus simple propositions. You know, simple propositions are the individual letters, but we make these complex propositions out of them. We make these more um, uh, complicated claims out of these simple components connected with what we call logical operators. And that's what all of these symbols are about right here. Um, these are all logical operators. So there's only five logical operators that we're dealing with. Um, and I'm going to talk about the meaning. I want to basically explain everything that's going on in this truth table kind of one by one and talk about how it sort of functions um, so you don't just have a table to memorize, but you actually understand why it has all the features that it does. And I actually, I, so, you know, even though our first example was really an or statement, 
I'd rather do and because and is a little more intuitive and you can kind of get the hang of this a little more easily um, before we start moving on to some of the more tricky, some tricky things that go on with these other operators. But let's just take the statement and. So if someone had claimed to you this statement, they said, Colonel Mustard and Miss Scarlet are both the murderers, then you'd have to wonder, okay, what does that statement mean? In other words, what would it mean if it was true? Under which conditions would this statement be true? And under which conditions would the statement be false? Okay, so let's, uh, let's kind of start down here. Let's say, in terms of what's going on in, in the world, like we don't know where the actual world is. It could be any of these categories. But let's just say, for the sake of argument, that the world, the facts of the world are in this, the, this category. So the real world is somewhere in here. The actual world, A for actual, let's say it was in this world. Um, this is a world in which it isn't true that Colonel Mustard is the murderer, and it isn't true that Miss Scarlet is the murderer. So if someone made this claim, if they said both Colonel Mustard and Miss Scarlet are the murderer in this world, if these facts being the way that they are, would they be making a true statement or a false statement? They'd be making a false statement, and I think your intuition will agree with me. Um, if I tell you two different claims that are both themselves false, then I have definitely made a false claim. So by saying, if someone is claiming that M Colonel Mustard and Miss Scarlet are both murderers, they're saying this world, the real world, is not anywhere to be found in this category. It can't happen here. Because if it did, it would be false. So if they're saying this is a true statement, then they're basically saying don't try to find the real world anywhere in this category. It won't be found here. If you believe them, then you'll make the same sort of move. If you don't believe them, then you'd leave this open. But then that makes that means you're thinking this statement is actually false. Part of the logical shape of this, me the meaning of this statement, not about whether the claim is true or false, but just what the statement is saying, is it's saying the real world will not be located in this quadrant right here. It's not going to be one of these possibilities. Likewise, it's ruling out this category and this category too. Because if they told you Colonel Mustard and Miss Scarlet are both murderers, and Colonel Mustard is a murderer, but Miss Scarlet is not, that would also make the statement false. So if you believe that what they're saying is true, then you're saying, okay, yeah, the real world won't be found here either. Same thing if Miss Scarlet is a murderer, but Colonel Mustard is not, that would also make this statement false. So basically, it's only going to be true. Making an AND statement is only true if both of the two component claims, the simple propositions that the complex one is made out of, are both themselves true, which means this quadrant. You've noticed that three out of the four possibilities are eliminated when you're making an AND statement. And that is just to say that you're actually receiving a lot of information. If you believe someone when they make a conjunction claim, when they say something and something else is both true, that's telling you a lot about the world. It's saying, you know, there's all these possibilities of where the actual world could be, but it's narrowing it down to just this quadrant. That's saying the actual world, it's got to be somewhere in here. There's no other options. It's got to be a world in which both things are true. Okay? The more quadrants that get eliminated as a part of the logical meaning of a statement, um, the more um, information it's really telling you. Think about it as if um, you went into this world and you didn't know anything about it, and you're slowly starting to learn things about the world. You're like, the real world could be anywhere in this huge realm of possibilities. But as I start to learn some more facts about the world, I'm slowly narrowing it down. I'm slowly being like, okay, it can't be over here, it can't be over there, it can't be over there. The actual world's got to be somewhere in here. Uh, the picture, you know, as science progresses and just, you know, knowledge of the world in general, as we make, as we learn more about the world, it's like the picture slowly coming into focus. There's a lot of things that are still fuzzy. We, there's a lot of things we're ignorant about right now. But it's coming into focus the more that we learn. Um, so the more claims that we make, the more we're able to actually locate where the actual world is. Okay. Now again, I've been sort of operating, you know, we're saying, what would it take for this claim to be true? Maybe the actual world's over here, and so the statement is actually false. But if you're trying to figure out, like, what is the statement saying? What kind of information is it presenting? It's making a pretty strong claim. It's saying the real world won't be found in any of these quadrants. It'll be found here. Now notice, 
this shape that I've drawn geometrically is exactly the same as the shape that you get here in the truth table. There's only four possibilities. When both component parts are true, when they're both false, and where one's true and the other one's false, and vice versa. And in all the cases, other than the case where both component parts are true, and statements are false. They're only true when both parts are true. Now again, this might be the, I mean, I've, I've met students and they have lots of different reactions and coming at things from different places here. And for some students, you know, this kind of formal logic stuff makes all the sense in the world. It's like a really complicated way of saying something obvious. Um, but the complication is gives us this kind of technical precision that we're going to be mobilizing um, to be able to do some really cool analytic work. Uh, and that's where logic really builds from is we, we want to make sure the foundations are solid that we're not playing some kind of guessing game we want to be really technically accurate here because we're building a lot on top of it um, other students if you're watching this video lecture you might be like I am totally lost I you know the symbol thing is really throwing me I don't know how to interpret what's going on in this table um, I'm not sure what's going on with this diagram you keep squiggling all over if you're in that kind of boat please talk to me ASAP um, sometimes with logic it just takes some time it just takes some time to get familiar with it um, to maybe hear the definitions and and uh, principles that are involved here a few more times or to have me give some more examples from different directions to make and it, eventually we can make it click if it's not clicking for you on your own please reach out to me and please contact me and let me help you um, the pattern uh, I, I've mentioned this a couple times in my video lectures so I'm gonna take a little tangent on this again but at this point in the quarter, there's still a lot of students who have never talked to me, who have never reached out for help or advice or, or anything. And um, I'm here for all of you. I'm I'm here to support you and to help you succeed. Um, so don't don't be shy, especially with this section. If you, if you're one of those students who just takes the logic like a fish to water, great, awesome. Uh, maybe you don't need my help or assistance. Uh, I probably can still help <laughs> quite a bit actually. And if you want to push it further, I'm always willing to talk about the next step in, in logic to pass what we'll be studying but if you're struggling with it too definitely contact me I am totally willing and I have tons of patience for talking this stuff out and if one thing isn't working I want to find something else that does work for you you can learn logic I in my I've taught logic to hundreds of students now and there has never been a case where I've worked with a student they've worked really hard and we've done we've done stuff together we've both given it our all and the student wasn't able to understand what was going on and failed or something. That has never happened. Um, so I feel pretty confident. Maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's going to be some examples. But I've, right now, with the hundreds of students' experience that I have, I'm pretty confident that everyone can learn logic. They can understand what's going on here. Um, so if you're struggling with it, please let me know. This is another one of those lectures where I really wish I had all of you right in front of me in person and I was talking in a classroom giving you this lecture because I always ask a lot of questions during this lecture about like is this making sense how are we doing where are we at and um, I want to be responsive to helping you wherever you're at with the material so please let me know how I can help okay tangent over um, probably sick of me saying the same message over and over but but uh, but please use me I'm here as a resource for you um, to give you support in learning this material. You don't have to tough it all out on your own. Okay. So, again, um, where I would kind of spun off from, this table right here and the truth values that show you under what conditions, again, the conditions are inputs here, under what conditions is this statement true and under which conditions is it false? And that is going to be the same as this little diagram I drew here. So that was for AND. Okay, and this is... Um, and is, is definitely probably the most intuitive operator out there that we've got to work with. Um, some of these elements have some other sneaky things, but there is a sneaky thing about the conjunction here. So when we're working with the conjunction, um, the and statements, I'm going to put that down here too, and, conjunction, and. Um, there's something you may have read in the book about um, this distinction between propositional and non-propositional conjunctions. What, they're ref what the book is referring to are cases of the English word and. That some of them have this logical form to them and some of them don't. 
Um, I'm just going to mention that right now and flag it. We're going to talk about this later when we get to doing translations. Um, but for right now, I don't want to talk about it. The most important thing is for you to understand how the logical expression of the conjunction, the logical propositional and works, which is basically to say that it's only true, the statement is only true under cases where the two component parts are true. Okay, so that's that's conjunction. Let's, uh, let's clear the board here and talk about our next operator, the disjunction, this little wedge right here, the, the or operator. So I'm going to clean up the board and I'll be right back. Okay, so next up, we're going to talk about or. And we call this operator a disjunction. And or, uh, this is an or statement um, with the wedge. Um, but here's where there's an issue here. Um, there are two types of disjunctions. We get two different types here. One we call inclusive, and the other we call exclusive. All right, so inclusive or exclusive or. And the English or, when we say or as a word in English, it's always ambiguous between these two different logical meanings, the inclusive or and the exclusive or. There actually is another symbol that we use um, that has this that has the same wedge here with a line underneath it that's the exclusive or that's the symbol we use for exclusive and this is the one we use for inclusive but I'm actually not going to allow you to use this symbol <laughs> if you're doing translations or just working with logic because even though some logical systems have this convention with the underline meaning it's exclusive uh, we don't, uh, as logicians, we really don't want to start putting a ton more symbols into the logical language. Um, I'm always fond of saying that um, logicians are super lazy. They want to do things in the laziest way possible. They don't want to make things more complicated than they have to be. And even though we're not going to be getting to this stage of logic in our little primer, where things are going is we're, the logicians are going to try to set up a set of rules that covers all of the valid inferences that could ever be made. And that might seem really daunting. It's actually not that hard to do. Um, but the more symbols that we have in the vocabulary, the more of these rules we need to memorize. And logicians don't want to do that. They want a clean, elegant system with as few rules as possible that does maximum work. Um, so we don't want to use this symbol. So I'm not going to let you use that. It's, it's out there. I just wanted to let you know. But we're not going to do it. And that's OK. Because instead of using this symbol, we've got something else we could do instead. There's going to be, and I'm going to leave this as a mystery for now, but there's another way that we can express the exclusive or meaning with the other symbols that we have in our logical symbol language. We don't have to invent a new symbol to capture that meaning. Um, but I'll do that after I demonstrate what's going on with the inclusive or. So I, you, at this point, you don't, I haven't even told you what the distinction is between inclusive and exclusive, but we'll get there. Let's start though with the inclusive or. And I was saying that the inclusive or is kind of like saying um, um, at least one of these two statements is true. Okay, that's what or is saying. So, there's my mouse here. At least one of these two statements is true. Um, so, if I've got C or S, I'm saying at least one of the two of them is true. And this statement, uh, to, to word it this way of at least one of them is true, is important uh, if you're going to try to figure out intuitively here what kind of truth table, under what conditions is this statement true, and under which conditions is it false. So let's see here. Um, let's say C and S are both true. So Colonel Mustard is a murderer, and Miss Scarlet is a murderer. And if I'm saying at least one of these two statements is true, that Colonel Mustard is a murderer or Miss Scarlet's a murderer, if they're both a murderer, then it is true that at least one of them is true. So that's great. So that's open. True. Sweet. We'll leave it open here. I'm not going to squiggle on it to eliminate it. This is an open possibility of where the actual world could be. What if we're over here now, and we're thinking about a world in which it's true that Colonel Mustard's a murderer, but Miss Scarlet is not? Is at least one of these two statements true? Well, yeah, it is. So, oh, we're going to leave this one open as well. And what about when Colonel Mustard is not the murderer but Miss Scarlet is? Well, that's also one where at least one of the two statements is true. So there we go. What about worlds in which they're both false? 
Well, that actually gets in the way of what this statement is saying is true, because it's saying at least one of them is true. But in this world, neither one of them is true. Okay, the facts don't line up with the claim. So that this is a world of well, this is a world in which the statement is false, and I'm symbolizing that by going nuts on scrape, scraping it out. We're, so if we're if we're believing the meaning here of this statement C or S, then what that means is that this cannot be where the actual world is. But notice this is very different from and because now, ooh, there's three categories where the, I don't know if the actual world's here. I don't know if it's here. I don't know if it's here. It could be any three of the of the three of them. So that's why an or statement is actually telling me less than an and statement. Remember again with and um, our uh, here I'll make a little mini version here. Um, with and, our little diagram looked like this. It looked like that, right? There was only one place where the real world could be. Here, there are now three. So we've narrowed down the possibilities less. If I know that at least one of these two things is true, that's not me knowing as much as if I know that both of them are true. Right, so that that's a really cool idea here. If that if that's not working, if that description didn't make sense, please let me know because I would want to explain that more to you. But that's a really cool idea here about understanding the meaning, the logical meaning. Again, going back to this little claim here, the logical meaning of a proposition is defined by its truth conditions, when and where it's true versus false. And again, if you're looking at the or statement, there's three ways that the statement could be true. So if I know P or Q is true, all I really know is that the real world can't be here, but I don't know of these three which one is true. If you tell me P and Q is true, well then I know the real world must be here, because in all of these cases, that's a false statement. Okay? There's only one way it can be true. It's a big difference between and and or, which hopefully accords with your intuitions, that when someone says A and B are both true, versus saying at least one of these true things is true, that you're like, oh, yeah, one of those things told me, you told me more the first time than the second time. Second thing wasn't as informative. Um, hopefully your intuition tells you that. So the inclusive or is saying at least one of these two statements is true. Okay. Now there's another way that we use or. Sometimes we use or to mean um, one or the other, but not both. Okay, so now let's let's clean this up a little bit. So if we're talking exclusive or now, so this is for the exclusive. I'm going to make a note about that. If we're talking about exclusive or, that's like saying one or the other of these two statements is true. And I'm going to put this in, in, in underline though. But not both of them. Okay. So this one or the other, and that's why I like to say one or the other, but not both. That's the phrase you want to remember for exclusive or. It's saying one or the other is true, but not both of them. So that means the truth table here is going to be really similar to the inclusive or, except with one minor adjustment. Um, boom. You can't find the real world here. It's saying one or the other, but not both. Okay, and actually now I really should have used this paint can thing, because that's a lot better than um, what I was doing. <laughs> That's goofy. Anyway, this is fun. Um, by saying one or the other but not both, I'm saying it can't be, it, it, the real world's got to be in only one of these two quadrants. It can't be in one in which they're both false, but it also can't be one in which they're both true. So it's like one or the other. That's it. Not both. Okay. That's the exclusive one. And there's a way that we can capture this meaning just working with the symbols that I that we already have. This is uh, something I alluded to earlier, and I want to start talking about this because, um, just like I was demonstrating in the last lecture, eventually you're going to have to make truth tables. You're going to have to calculate these truth values for expressions that are not just the basic expressions that you're given in your sort of key here that shows you all the patterns. Um, let me uh, erase the whiteboard here and start showing you what I have in mind. So let's go here. So we're trying to, uh, um, let's just call this understanding the exclusive 
Ugh. Oh man, it's too late. The exclusive disjunction. Or or. Okay. So that's our title here. Understanding the exclusive disjunction or. Um I've got the inclusive one or we got this phrase. Um one or the other, but not both. Let's see if uh, we can just kind of intuitively suss this out. Again, I don't want to do a lot of translations here, but maybe we can figure it out. But um, here, here's another little side note here. If we've got all these different operators like this one, uh, these operators are always gluing together. You can think about them as gluing together one stuff and another stuff. And what that stuff could be could be a simple proposition, just a simple letter. Or it could be a more complex expression itself. So actually, the way we're going to translate the exclusive disjunction is with this expression. Um, P or Q, parentheses, and not P and Q. So now we're starting to make our logical symbol language a little more complicated by putting in these parentheses. And there's there's actually a specific skill that I think is important for being able to do well with logic. And it's, it's a skill I call chunking. It's a way of visualizing these logical expressions to be able to recognize that this expression right here is really a big and statement. It's just this thing and this thing. See the and is gluing the two parts together? Just the same as if we had something like, you know, you can have an and statement that's just this simple, P and Q, one thing, right? You can have one thing and another thing, and the and is gluing the two bits together. But there's nothing stopping us from making those bits a little more complicated. Um, and that's what's going on here. So let's go back here. Even if we just wanted to take, uh, for example, just this part of the expression. Let me just copy and paste it here. This, this is really a more complicated version, just a slightly more complicated version of the not P pattern. It's not something, right? You've got, um, you know, in the not P pattern, there's a thing that then receives a negation. That's all that's going on here, right? You just got a more complicated thing in that box. It's an AND statement that then is getting negated. So this kind of this ability to visualize a more complicated expression as really having these component parts is really essential to doing a, a good logical analysis. And in particular, when we're calculating um, truth values for these more complex expressions, things get a little dicey. But if you take it step by step um, and do it one step at a time, you'll find that even calculating something that's more complicated like this you don't have to do it all in your head. It's really just a bunch of simple things. You just have to get them all in the right order. Okay, and we're going to take advantage of the chunking thing to figure this out. So um, let me make up, uh, or let's actually do to do. I want to put some little notes in here. I'm going to pause it for a second. Okay, so we already kind of worked out um, how the inclusive or worked, but now we're trying to figure out the exclusive or, um, and we're um, I'm saying that the exclusive or is going to have the same pattern as um, as this statement right here. Okay? So if we can figure out what's going on with this truth table, we can actually use that to figure out what's happening with the exclusive or truth table. So what I'm about to demonstrate right now is part the, the process that you use for making a truth table, for calculating the truth values of um, of uh, the truth conditions for um, these more complicated logical expressions. This is one of the skills we're trying to learn in this module, in this unit. And this might look really scary at first, this this whole expression right here and trying to figure out, you know, okay, what if P is true and Q is true? Is this statement true or not or what? Uh, 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 that might be hard to figure out, okay? Um, just if you're trying to do it in your head. But you don't have to just do it in your head. Um, I'm gonna make this really small, just so that it fits. Um, you don't have to do it all in your head. We can do a step-by-step -step procedure to to figure this out. So here's how it works. Um, this might be this is exactly like what a problem might look like on the exam. I'll give you an expression like this one, 
and I'll ask you, give me a truth table. The first thing you'd have to do is figure out all the different letters that show up in that expression. So here we got P's and we got Q's. And you're going to set up first all the possible conditions for those different uh, letters that you've got in the expression. So we got P's and Q's here, and we're covering all of our bases. We've got the case in which they're both true, the case in which they're both false, case in which one is true, the other false, and vice versa. Now, if we had more different letters in here, if it was like P, Q, and R, then things would get a little more complicated. Then we'd have to um, we'd have to calculate for three different letters, which would actually be. I'll show you. I can show you this right now. Um, this would be a far more complicated. But let's say we're trying to calculate all the possibilities for P and Q and R. This is like we've got three different levers now, okay? Um, and if there are three different levers and they can only be in one or two positions, um, again, you can figure out how many different possible combinations there are based on two um, to the, where is that caret symbol? Oh, I can't find it. There it is. Two to the nth power, where n is the number of different letters. So here we've got two to the third power because we've got three different letters we're dealing with and that's like two times two times two which is eight okay so I know I'm gonna have eight different possibilities now here's a fun procedure to learn because I will be making you um, calculate truth tables up to three different letters if it, it's you know it starts exponentially increasing how many possibilities you have to deal with and gets to be a real pain in the neck but I will be asking you to do it all the way up to three, which means calculating for eight possibilities. So here's the trick. Figure out the total number of possibilities. Then in the first column, cut those in half. Make So if we've got, we got eight possibilities here. So I'm going to go, oops, I'm going to go true, 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 true. And I'm going to go false, 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 false. There we go. So I've got all um, eight possibilities captured for P. Half, you know, P can either be true or false. Those are the only combination. So half of them have to be true, half of them have to be false. Same thing is true with Q, but let's now take that pattern of going 4 by 4. Let's cut that in half. So now let's go 2 by 2. And then I'm going to cut that pattern in half one more time for the third column. So now I'm going 1 by 1. And if you follow this method, you won't have to think it all out every time. You'll have a foolproof way of making sure you've captured all the possible combinations. Check it out here. We've got the possibility where they're all true, the possibility where they're all false. Then we've got, you know, two true, one false, where R is the false one, two true, one false, where Q is the false one, and two true, one false, where P is the false one. And then we also have... Um, two false, one true, where P is the true one, two false, nope, uh, two false, one true, where Q is the true one, and then two false, one true, where R is the true one. So we've covered all of the combinations here without fail. Use this method. Please use this method when you're doing your truth tables and practicing them because when it comes to the next exam and I'm grading all of these, um, you really... <laughs> It'll be a lot more of a pain in the neck for me to grade if you're not doing it consistently like this. So for, for your sake and for mine, please use this method. Uh, if you don't use this method, you'll probably be pulling your hair out trying to make sure you've covered all the possibilities. Um, and I'm sorry, the microphone just fell. And you don't want to be doing that. Um, there's, there's, this is the much easier, uh, more painless way to do it. Okay, so, but we're, right now we're not dealing with P, Q, and R because, only because, the statement that we're making a truth table for does not contain R. It's only talking about P's and Q's. So this was just to get you ready for a more complicated problem in the future. Um, probably come back to this sometime. Right now we're only dealing with P's and Q's, which means we only have two letters, right? So back to the whole pattern here. It's two to the nth power, where N is the number of different letters. In this case, 2 to the second power, which is 2 times 2, which is 4. Okay, so you notice there's four possibilities. First column, half true, half false, and split that in half. Boom, covered all of our bases. Awesome. Excellent. Okay, so now we got to just get, that's all the setup. Now we got to get to the actual calculating. So let's do it. Here's how I want you to think about it. 
Think about it like you're doing four different calculations. We don't know which value is supposed to go to this, like whether this statement is true or false under each of these different possible combinations. We've got to calculate it. That, that's not something where you can just do them all at once. You have to do each one of them one at a time. So we're going to do it one at a time. Let's first start with this first category. Is this statement going to be true or false under cases where P and Q are both true? Okay, now the first thing we would do to calculate that, this is kind of like Wheel of Fortune a little bit. So you're going to, I, uh, this, this is kind of over on your scratch paper. And I recommend you definitely doing things the long way like I'm about to demonstrate um, before you start trying to do them in your head or just, you know, figure them out quickly. Um, definitely do it the long way until you're really comfortable with that. And also, incidentally, the technique I'm teaching here, different from the book. I think my way is better. Uh, that's what my mom always said was going to be on my tombstone. I had a better idea. But I think I do have a better idea in this case. So, again, this comes from lots of experience in teaching logic to hundreds of students. Um, I think this is going to be a more intuitive way for you to learn how to do truth tables than the, the technique that the book teaches. But the first step here is to take the you know the values seriously here. We're, we're talking about a world in which P is true and which Q is true. So I'm gonna put true every time uh, below every time I see a P because in this world P is true and then we're also talking about Q being true. So I'm gonna substitute true as the truth value that Q has. Okay now at this stage I haven't calculated any of the more complex chunks. Remember I was talking about chunks earlier. I'm just finding the values for the individual components. But here's the cool thing about logic. If I know um, these patterns of how these operators work at, then it doesn't matter what things they're holding together. I can always figure out their values using the same basic patterns that all these operators always work at. So let's say here, let's first try to evaluate uh, this P or Q chunk. So this is in parentheses, right? So it's one chunk. I like to use this method where I draw it a line because it's sort of like the value that's going to go below the line, whatever value I input here, is the one that sort of gets assigned to this entire chunk. So if I know that P is true, is a true statement, and Q is a true statement, then what if someone is saying at least one of these two things is true, which is what they're saying when they're saying P or Q in the inclusive version of or. And here, I can I can look it up on the chart, you know. If, uh, if I'm talking about an or statement, and the two component parts are both true, then that means the overall chunk is going to be true. So that's the value I'm going to put here. So by putting a value here underneath this line, I'm saying, you know, ignore all the rest of this junk over here. Don't care about that. Just look in at this. And this part is true. Okay, the P or Q chunk is true. Now let's go over here and do this chunk. We've got a P and Q. And again, just like ignore all the rest of it. Like just pretend like that stuff doesn't even exist, okay? So if I was going to be doing this, you know, I'm not thinking about any of this junk over here. Here, let me, there we go. Just, I'm just looking at this chunk for the time being when I'm evaluating this operator and this P and Q chunk. What's going on there? Well, P is true and Q is true. So are both of them true? Yep, that's a true statement. So that's what I'm going to put as the value here underneath this line. It's true. And again, the line is just supposed to extend upwards to only cover the part of the expression that I'm evaluating at the current time. Now, like we said earlier, um, this chunk right here, the not P and Q, is really just not something, not this chunk. So if this chunk turns out to be true, then once we factor in what's happening here with the, the negation, that's just going to flip its value. Now, we haven't talked about negations a whole heck of a ton yet, um, but negations are, are very, very simple. Um, it's like saying something is not the case. So if, if let's I don't know, let's have P stand for... Um, um, let's have P stand for uh, the Cubs won tonight, okay, because that isn't true, unfortunately. <laughs> so if P was the Cubs won tonight, then saying not P would be saying the Cubs did not win tonight. And if I'm claiming the Cubs did not win, 
when in fact they did, then I'd be making a false statement. But if it is false that the Cubs won, then to deny that would be to say something true. By saying the Cubs did not win, that's a true statement if it's false that the Cubs won. Maybe go back and watch that little part of the video again if you want to catch what I just said and just hear it a couple more times. Um, but the, functionally, if you're going to think about this just like a game, what negations do is they flip the truth value of whatever they're negating. They turn a negative into a positive, a positive into a negative. Um, and if you put two negations out there, like if I, for whatever reason, wanted to say, um, here, I'll put this over here. If I wanted to say not, not P, that's like the same thing as saying P. Okay, just flip the light switch twice, then it's going to be in the same position that it started in. Um, so that's how negations work. So if I know that this chunk right here is true, then not something true is actually saying something false. Okay, so if I deny something that is in fact true, then I made a false claim. So now I know, you know, again, you can kind of pretend here like these lines go upward. So now, you know, I got something like this going on. So this false value is telling me what this whole chunk is. Now again, I can know, and now I'm in a position to figure out what's going on with the AND statement. Because I know the two chunks that the AND is putting together. The first part is true, the second part is false. So if I'm making an AND statement, and if you remember how the AND works in terms of its truth table, remember how AND works in its truth table, um, if the first part is true and the second part is false, that's like this line right here. First part true, second part false for P and Q, that's a false statement right there. Okay. In order for it to tr be true, both parts have to be true. So that didn't happen. Okay. So, we've done something very significant now. Now that we've calculated this AND thing, we've figured out the truth value that applies to the entire expression under these starting conditions. And whatever value we have here at the bottom, that's the value that is our answer for um, whether or not the statement is true or false under those conditions. So we did one calculation just now, and now we got to do three more. So let's do them. Let's just get some more practice here. So you can see it. Whoa! Did not want to do that. Uh, uh, okay. I don't know what's happening here. Let me fix this. Uh, okay. Uh, let's try this again. What? <laughs> All right. Let me pause the video for a second. All right. I fixed it. That was goofballs. Okay. So now we're going to calculate for the next situation. This is a situation in which P is a true statement and Q is a false statement. So let's put our values in here. So all the P's are going to be true. There we go. And the Q's this time are false. So it's a little asymmetrical that we're dealing with here. Okay, so the Q's are false. And now I'm going to do this little chunking thing again. And really, um, I'm going to bring up the video again. The key to doing truth table calculations properly, to calculating truth values, the, ma the mantra to memorize is to work inside out. Inside out. You know, with all those parentheses that are showing up in these more complicated expressions, they're kind of like um, Russian nesting dolls. There's like a big expression, but it's composed of all these smaller chunks that are broken down. So you always want to work inside out, parts to holes. That's the secret. That's the order of operations for doing these calculations. So let's go back here. So I'm going to work inside the parentheses and work my way out. So again, I got an or statement here where one part's true and the other part's false. Well, with or, all it takes is at least one of them to be true for the whole thing to be true, and that's happening. So that whole statement is true. Okay. How about over here? Let's go work inside out again. Let's do this and statement. So here's an and statement where one part's true and the other part's false. For and, that can't happen. It's not the case that both of them are true. So that's a false statement. And statements are only true if both of their components are true. Okay, so we figured that out. 
Now that we know what the P and Q part is, now we can figure out not P and Q. So now we can bring that line, draw that over a little bit, bring in the negation down here. In fact, I actually want to pull it a little farther to make it clear that now this calculation is including the negation. So if I'm negating something that is false, then I'm making a true statement. So if it is false that P and Q are both true, for me to say it's not the case that P and Q are both true is actually to say something true. So there we go. Awesome. Awesome possum. Okay, so now this first chunk of the AND statement is true. And the second chunk of the AND statement is true. So if I've got true and true, I've got a true statement on my hands. Boom. And look at this. Even though this AND is gluing together these more complicated expressions, it's really the same thing as a normal P and Q sort of a simple um, expression of a conjunction. If both of the two parts, the P, the P part and the Q part, whatever those parts are, whether they're an individual letter or a more complicated chunk, if those are both true, then the AND statement is true. That's the beauty of logic. That's the power of it. That once you know these simple patterns, then we can do really complicated stuff just building off of those simple patterns. So that's what's, that's what's fun about logic. That's what's powerful about it. It's pattern recognition. So true is the value that we found for the whole expression under these conditions. So whatever value is here at the bottom, that's the one I put in my truth table. All right, we got two more to do. Let's just, let's just bang them out. Let's do them. All right, so now we're calculating for this possibility. Oops, um, here we go. And this time P is false under these circumstances that we're calculating for now. And Q is the true one. Okay, let's see if that changes anything. Oh, oops, with how it's all going to pan out. Okay, there we go. We got our initial inputs in there. And we got a couple chunks. Really, the chunk patterns are always going to look the same here, right? Because that's the structure of the sentence of the logical expression. It's got this sort of same structure to it. Okay. And so now let's do our calculations. So um, a false or true statement, I mean it's saying at least one of these two things is true and that's the case. So boom, we've got a true or statement here. Now over here we've got an and statement. It's saying both of these things are true. Well that's not happening because one of them is false. So that's a false statement. Now this is saying it's denying the false statement, so that's actually going to be something true. Again, we've got a true and a true, and that's a true and statement. And statements, it's saying both of these things are true, and that's what's happening. So boom, it's true. So there we get, oops, and we get true there. All right, one more to go. One more to go. Let's do it. So now they're both false, right? We're calculating this last possibility. The P and Q are both false. So I'm going to put false, 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 false. All right. And let's build our chunks. We got this chunk. We got this chunk. And then once we figure out that chunk, we can figure out this chunk. And then when we got both of these chunks, we can figure out the big one. There we go. Okay. So, false or false statement. Well, the, this thing is saying at least one of these two things is true. That's not happening. So we've got a false statement on our hands. Now, here's an interesting little trick. Notice, um, I could look at this whole expression and see through chunking, visually, that this is really a big AND statement. It's just putting this chunk together with this statement. But what do we know about ANDs? ANDs are only true when they're both true. If any one of them was false, then the whole thing is false. So as soon as I know that one of the two chunks of an AND statement is false, I actually know the whole thing is false. It doesn't even matter what's going on over here. Doesn't matter. Now we could calculate it anyway, and maybe we should. So if we got a false and a false statement, well that's definitely false. It's saying they're both true. That's not happening. False. But the negation is going to swoop down and change that, make it true. Boom. Denying something false is saying something true. So now we've got an AND statement with a false and a true. And when the first part's false, second part's true, AND statements are false. 
But we didn't have to do that. We didn't have to go through and do all those calculations um, in as much as knowing one bad apple spoils the whole batch if we're talking about AND statements. Okay, that's the AND pattern. That's how the AND truth table works. But now we're all done. We have figured out what this final value is. We know that it's supposed to be false. And now we have completed the truth table. So if I was asking on the exam, give me a truth table for this expression, this would be your final answer right here. You know, you'd have the P and Q set up and then you'd have this chart and that would, this would be your answer. You filled out the truth values under all the possible conditions. That's great. And what we wanted to do here though, was to use it to describe the exclusive disjunction. And so this is the other thing that's exploiting this principle of logic, that the logical meaning is defined by the truth conditions. If two things have the same logical meaning, then that means they have to have all the same truth conditions. They have to have all the exact same values in their truth tables. And if that's happening, then they mean the same thing. So we can use, we can use this more complicated expression, P or Q, but and not both P and Q, we can use that to capture this meaning of the exclusive disjunction, which was saying one or the other, but not both. So at least one of them is true, but not both of them. Right? There's a false value if they're both true. So there we go. That's the um, inclusive and exclusive disjunction. That's the truth tables that they have. And this is how you, I, I've demonstrated in this video for you, how you can calculate truth values of more complicated expressions. And this is going to be one of the core um, skills that you'll want to learn. Um, at, at so far this point, we haven't talked about conditionals or biconditionals. But just with and, or, and negation under your belt, you can do some of the exercises from the homework that are asking you to do truth tables. So I would recommend maybe taking a little break here um, before diving into the next video lecture whenever you're going to do that. You know, try out some of those problems for yourself. See if you can't go through the whole process I just did um, for yourself using your own scratch paper here and filling out a truth table for some expression. In fact, if you're feeling really ambitious, you can just start making logical expressions for yourself using all of these um, uh, different symbols. Although there's a, a rule here I want to show you before, and I'm going to do this before we go. So we've got a few different operators that we've learned. We've learned negation, we've learned and, and we've learned or. But these have a different type of structure to them. Negations always are just negating something. You know, they have this sort of pattern to them. And and or statements always got to put together two things, like this. They're always gluing together two stuffs. And those stuffs could be, you know, they could be simple propositions. Oops, I've been using capital letters here. It could be simple propositions, or they could be more complicated things, like maybe not P and... Q or R. How about that? You know, that's a that's a and statement. One chunk and another chunk. That's okay. The only thing that can't happen here is you can't have, like, this makes no sense. I don't know what this is saying. And P doesn't make sense. Or if I did P. Oh, man, I keep doing that. P and Q and R. This makes no sense either. you got to use the parentheses to make sure that it's always one chunk and another chunk getting put together, like I've drawn it up here. Something and something else. Maybe a simple letter and something more complicated. That's okay. okay. But negations, this doesn't make sense, for example. That, I don't I don't know what that is. That doesn't say anything. Because while ands and ors glue two parts together, negations don't glue anything. They just are tacked on in front of something. They're saying not something. That's all. That's how that always works. But the negation could be to something fairly complicated, like um, I can start to use brackets here too if you want to. Um, you know, maybe we've got uh, something like that. Boom. So you know, let's let's actually do this one just to see the chunks here. Work inside out, right? So it's really a big not statement, not something, not. So you've got the whole statement would include the negation, right? It'd go, it'd be like, you know, this. 
But then this is another chunk. The bracket is a chunk. And then you've also got P and the Q and R chunks held together with OR. Okay? So this is chunking. This is and so if you if you're feeling comfortable with chunking, you can just start making bunches of problems for you to do just to get extra practice. You can just make something up. You can be like, let's do P and not R or not P. I, I don't know. You can just do this stuff for days, right? You can make all these problems and then uh, practice doing truth tables with them. If you're running into trouble with this, um, lo like I said, logic can be tricky. Um, it can take a little while for it to sink in. I definitely think more than any other module in this entire quarter that the logic module really benefits from doing a little bit of practice every day. Do a little bit every day, at the very least, a little bit of logic every day, and you'll really pick it up rather than trying to cram it. Cramming it will just not work with logic. Or it's just the success rate's a lot lower for that. Um, trust me, I got some experience with this. But if you do a little bit of logic, it works. And don't bang your head against this. If you're feeling stuck, contact me immediately. Send me a text. Call me. Um, uh, you know, five minutes on the phone with me can save you hours and hours and hours. I sound like a Geico commercial, but I mean, I can save you a lot of hours of pain and misery beating your head against this stuff. Let me talk it through with you, especially if we can do a video chat and we can draw on paper and show each other work rather than trying to describe it with language. That always works better. So let me help you out with this. If you're struggling with it, um, we can we can clean it up. We can we can help you get a handle on it. So. Um, let me know. Okay, so the next video lecture, I'll talk about the conditionals. So those are the last two operators we haven't talked about. But you're now in a position to get some practice doing truth tables, and you're familiar with these three operators, negation, conjunction, and disjunction. Now. Okay, see you next time.